And so as we came to building our business and it being more successful, I kind of started to to feel and kind of hear these this tagline of like wanting to help heart-centered entrepreneurs and heart-centered coaches become business savvy. Because, and you've probably seen this in the space, I started to see a lot of people who, it seemed like they didn't care that much about people and they just wanted to make money. And then I saw a lot of people who I think really cared about people who were making no money. And I think that the reason is because business growth often ha happens from a very logical implementation, taking action, and very um, a rational standpoint. Whereas a lot of the people who like really care and they love the work they do, a lot of them rely a lot on their feelings and a lot on how it feels to them. And I want to kind of bring those worlds to, together because I thought the coaching space would be a lot better if we taught the people who care the most how to be the best on the business side of things. Hey everyone, welcome to the Entrepreneurs in Recovery podcast. Welcome to another week. Uh, I'm really excited about life right now in Costa Rica. There's been a lot of happenings here. Uh, this morning, I did my first shamanic breathwork ceremony. It was about an hour and a half, and it was with a woman named Jema Luna. So if you're in Costa Rica and you're near uh, Uvita, I highly recommend uh, you check out her work. So uh, during that breath work, I had an experience of the waves, meaning the feminine and the masculine polarity of waves. And as a new surfer, taking my licks and falling quite a bit, what I realized in that breathwork ceremony is there is a feminine part of the wave, which is the receiving part of the wave where you let go and you get to ride the wave. And there's also the masculine, which is swimming into the wave and making it happen to get on the wave. But eventually, once you're on the wave, you have to let go. And so um, I got this really interesting download I wanted to share with you all uh, that happened in breathwork today. So thank you all for subscribing and liking to the show. Thank you for checking out the YouTube and liking subs and subscribing there to get weekly episodes. This week's guest I am excited about. This is a gentleman that uh, is in the online coaching. He's, he's a business coach to online coaches. Uh, but more importantly, he is authentic and he's a heart-centered businessman. And I like having people like that on the show. So this conversation, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. If you are someone who is interested in coaching or just being an entrepreneur and this sort of new climate and this new age, I think it's a great episode to tune into and listen to. Ruben has a lot to offer. And I'm really hoping you can take a lot out of this heart-centered conversation um, and all the topics that we went into today. So enjoy. Hey, Ruben, welcome to the show. Hey, welcome so much, Jesse. Really excited to be on. Yeah, me too. And you know, we recently met only like I think in the last week, a uh, couple weeks maybe. Yeah, and it's really cool how that works. Um, when oh, who's your friend over there? I see a dog yeah, coming up. And... Yeah, a little puppy on the side here. She is like, wow, you're on a podcast. We need to, uh, we need to do yeah, something yeah. now. Well, what's 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 his name or her name? Uh, this is Maya. She's a uh, Siberian husky. She likes to uh, run in the mountains with me. We went for a run this morning and. Now, apparently she needs some attention. <laughs> All right. Well, that's cool. That's really cool. Well, that's what happens when you're doing a podcast. Like you never yes. know what's going to happen. And uh, so Ruben, you know, we met uh, recently and we met through a friend, Kate, Kate Pintor. She introduced us together. Kate has been a, a great connector of people connecting, you know, heart centered entrepreneurs uh, to me and me to her. And um, that's how we got connected. And, you know, you have a really interesting business and, um, and, a, and a really an interesting story of, you know, struggle, triumph, pain, overcoming transformation. So I'm really looking forward to getting to know you a little bit, a little bit better on this podcast. And I like to really just start out with, uh, we'd love to hear about your story, maybe sharing yeah. your story with us. How did you become the person you are today? Wherever you'd like to start with that. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I actually grew up in a tiny town in rural Manitoba in Canada, and uh, there wasn't much options of what you could do or who you could become. Basically, the options were either like a farmer, a pastor, or you worked construction was kind of like the options. And it was 
um, in, in one sense, it was kind of fun to grow up in the middle of nowhere, but also there wasn't a lot of like, I always felt like there's got to be something bigger or more. And um, it was something that just kind of kept a gnawing at the back of my mind. And so growing up there, there was obviously a lot of, yeah, kind of like you were sheltered from the rest of the world. So as I started to grow up, go to university, start to see things, all of a sudden, like this whole massive world opened up to me. And it was kind of scary in one sense, but also very exciting. So started to dabble into all the different things as far as like what I wanted to do for work, what is entrepreneurship, what are all these different things and kind of leaving a lot of that conservative kind of early age, I guess, lessons that I taught and getting out there and exploring and actually like not being scared of it. And so it was a long journey, um, but I found my wife there. We kind of actually started being entrepreneurs together. She started right before me, actually. She Right when we got married, actually, she was working online full-time. And I was actually working as a bricklayer at that time. So I was laying bricks, laying brick driveways, um, wanting and dreaming of a better tomorrow. Um, but then I saw her and I was like, wow, she is like making good money. And she's posting on Instagram. I never thought I would be on social media. Growing up, I was a part of this club, which was like the never go on social media club, you know, very like small town kind of mindset. And so eventually I, I joined her in her business because I was kind of sick of wheelbarrowing around limestone every single day for like 12 hours. And so I joined her, kind of started the entrepreneur journey. I tried a couple different businesses. I think six or seven have failed really bad, by the way. Um, so learned the hard way, was not a natural entrepreneur, wasn't naturally gifted in a lot of the things I do right now, whether it's uh, the coaching, the the sales, the marketing, the networking, not, not natural at all. Um, and so that was kind of the start of our journey. And um, it, through a lot of twists and turns, a lot of ups and really big downs as well, it's led us to where we are today. And so that's a little bit of our background, kind of coming from a place of literally never being on the web and never being on social media to now running businesses on it, but still as we can get into more. So enjoying the disconnecting from it as well. Wow. Yeah, that's really impressive. And I think one of the things I'd like to hear more of is like these six or seven businesses that failed because yeah, yeah. I think a lot of, a lot of people come into this space, uh, especially solo as like a solopreneur and they expect to be successful on their first go you know, whether that's with yeah. coaching or product or something. And I've certainly learned that as well, but I'd like to hear maybe a little bit more about these six or seven businesses. For sure. What, what caused you to keep going? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, Honestly, it was probably a little bit of naivety. Maybe it was a little bit of delusion that made me keep on going, being like, there's got to be something that's going to work. I mean, the first one I tried, honestly, was actually trying my own bricklaying business because I was like, oh, I know how to do this. Um, I did a couple jobs on my own and just realized I didn't want to do it. Um, I tried some different online marketing things. I tried some affiliate marketing. I tried some of the classic, some network marketing stuff. Um, what were the other ones? I, there was, there was a couple other ones that literally probably lasted like drop shipping, like a month or two. And, um, a lot of them I was excited about. I was very easy. Like it was very easy for me to get excited about things, but I often kept running into this wall of things just aren't working. Things aren't working. I'm not making enough money. And I was in that kind of classic situation of like, I would quit my job to go after something. Then like a couple months later, I would have to go find another job because it mm -hmm. didn't work out. And that happened for a couple different years um, and it wasn't very fun. Um, but a part of me was just like, there's these people online and they say they're making money and they're doing all this and they're remote working from wherever they want and they're traveling. And like, so it's gotta be possible. And to be completely frank, I mean, you said like, why did I keep going? I mean, part of it could have been the delusion, but I've always been good at being resilient and ke like keeping on the track and not falling off with many things in life. Um, mm. When I was younger, I wanted to learn to play music. My parents literally told me that I was really bad and that I should stop playing music. That just made me want to do it even more. I eventually became professional and got paid to play music. It was yeah. a, kind of the same thing with entrepreneurship in a lot of ways. Basically, everything I've gotten good at in life was something I was not naturally good at. And I just stuck with it long enough to get pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And so with entrepreneurship, I think it's no different than some of those other skill sets. And even when I talk with friends in, in the entrepreneurial realm, 
a lot of them say the same thing. A lot of them are like, yeah, six failures or six businesses failed, or maybe it's 12 or whatever it is. I find a lot of the people who are successful now tried so many things. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of the entrepreneurial journey. It's, I think it's lucky if you can, if you can make it in the first like one, two or three things you try, I think that's the outliers, not the norm. Wow. Yeah. That's the gold right there. I can really relate. And I love how you said like, you weren't naturally good at this. This wasn't like a natural thing that you had. And I think that's also really important. Like people, mm -hmm. and I'm sure this happens to you, people will look at me and they'll be like, oh, but you, you have this and you're really good at speaking and you're a good facilitator. It's like, I yeah. wasn't good at any of this. I'm, exactly. I was extremely shy, depressive, anxious, like all the yeah. things, all the things. And I had to step into my comfort zone to be able to step out of it and then mm -hmm. be able to then do that repeatedly and then eventually pay pay money to learn training of how to facilitate and then go and do it for with local places offering no money at all mm -hmm. just doing it to get better at it and you know and I'm still in that place I've gotten better at some things for sure but right. I think that's a great point you know people don't want to try because they don't you know, they don't think it's worth it or they don't feel mm -hmm. worthy or there's no talent in them and other people have been blessed with talent. And I mm -hmm. think that, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's true. I think we have to put in the time and yeah. yeah so, so yeah. So, and, and I know like you've had your own struggles too, like financially and then yeah. going from, so where did it start to change? So, you know, you had this great time question. when you were broke financially, when did it start to shift? Yeah. Great question. Um, so it kind of started to shift when my wife and I kind of started to work on the business a little bit together on a health and fitness coaching business at the time. And, um, we had tried a couple different mentors. We were, we were kind of very much in the personal development space and we've been sold on a lot of different mindset can help you money mindset stuff, which by the way, is fine, but we'd never gotten someone to actually help us more on the business development and strategic side of things. And we, we were at kind of a bit of our wits end and we, we actually had to borrow money from our parents, which is the most embarrassing thing ever to, to hire a mentor. And it was finally that mentor who taught us how to utilize and harness social media in a way that actually generated leads and actually got sales. Um, it was about six months from starting that mentorship where we went from averaging one to two thousand dollars a month to finally getting up to about seven to eight thousand dollars a month, and that was a massive turning point for us. Um, I mean, frankly, we were probably a couple months away from probably having to call it quits for good, and so it's a good thing that it happened at that point because we probably could not have held on very much longer. And so it started to make some changes when we realized how social media could work and how a lot of people utilize it incorrectly or they utilize it because they see other people doing it in a certain way. Instead of thinking of it like a business, tracking the right things, understanding what's actually going to help people buy from me versus just getting good engagement. And so there was a couple pieces. I think this was back in, I think it was 20 when this kind of started to shift for us. And um, yeah, it was um, it, it was a hard season. We had to learn a lot of things. We're still skill building in a lot of ways. Um, back to kind of the, uh, I wasn't actually talented at this. In those months when I would do sales calls, my wife would leave the house because she thought it just sounded so terrible whenever I was on a sales call. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't something that was pretty, but we put the work in. We, we, we tried to be coachable. We tried to find mentors who had done this already. Um, and I think a big piece as well, I, I love mindset work. I love personal development work. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like a lot of people could use more strategy and implementation and actually a little bit less of the mindset and personal development stuff, just from my angle of how, mm -hmm. what actually shifted things for me, um, wasn't necessarily what I was thinking. It was more so what was I doing? Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously there's, there's, connections to those two different things. But that was a big piece for me is just knowing the right things to do and just being consistent. Yeah, that's something I'm learning too, as I'm stepping into my business in year seven is the magical thinking, the personal growth and develop, like all that stuff is great. But really this, the practical, rational business, mm -hmm. sound business strategies is what I'm, I'm also now learning the hard way. Yeah. 
because mm-hmm. I did rely on magical thinking and, and referrals and things coming out of thin air. Yeah. And, so, and they would a lot of times, so I would justify it. But then you'd have these long droughts and mm-hmm. you'd have to put on debt. You'd have to put on credit card. You'd have to put on loans. And then it's like, whoa. And, and then when are you going to ask for help, right? And it sounds exactly. like you had an amazing mentor to help guide you. And, it, and, it's, and that's like what's happening in your business today, right? That's what you do for people. You help yeah. coaches to, to, to do that. You mentor them into scaling their coaching business, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, we noticed because even though these mentors were helpful for us, we realized that they didn't seem like they were that caring for us, actually. Like they would teach us the right things, but they weren't actually that nice in a lot of ways. And so as we came to building our business and it being more successful, I kind of started to to feel and kind of hear these this tagline of like wanting to help heart-centered entrepreneurs and heart-centered coaches become business savvy. Because, and you've probably seen this in the space, I started to see a lot of people who it seemed like, again, this is from an outsider's perspective, it seemed like they didn't care that much about people and they just wanted to make money. And then I saw a lot of people who I think really cared about people who are making no money. And I think that the reason is because business growth often ha- happens from a very logical implementation, taking action, and very um, a rational standpoint. Whereas a lot of the people who like really care and they love the work they do, a lot of them rely a lot on their feelings and a lot on how it feels to them. And I want to kind of bring those worlds to- together because I thought the coaching space would be a lot better if we taught the people who care the most how to be the best on the business side of things. So that's where we've kind of coaches creating impact, um, heart centered and business savvy. That's where a lot of this kind of was born from is this desire to help those people make more money so they could sustain a business. Because the truth is, you're not getting clients who won't sustain a business. Um, and referrals, word of mouth is great, but a lot of these clients wanted a controllable way, a much more simple way of getting clients and having the ability to coach because they wanted to coach. They want to coach people. A lot of them would always say, I just want to coach people. And then I was like, well, the truth is to get the clients, you have to learn these skills just because just, just as in, if you wanted to coach the clients, you have to get those skills. To get the clients, you have to get those skills. So there's skill acquisition and work that isn't needed. And so that's why we came into the space. And that's kind of been our mission for the last, um, I guess, almost been seven years now, um, is helping those entrepreneurs. Because um, we just think that's going to be a better space environment in the coaching online world overall once that happens. Yeah, I think uh, I'm curious, like you were going to be a pastor, right? You were studying yeah. to be a pastor. So, so I'm kind of, I wonder how that has bridged into working with heart centered entrepreneurs in, in the space that you do. And yeah, there's a correlation very much. I mean, I think, I think I, I went down the road of, yeah, studying to become a pastor because it seemed like you're helping people. It's a nice way to help people um, in, in that kind of religious space. Um, and the coaching space seems similar in a lot of ways where you're truly trying to care for people, help them become their best selves and all those good things. And that's, I think something that I've always wanted to do is to like the word impact is such a overused cliche word in the, in the coaching space, but I always wanted to leave some sort of mark at the end of the day. And so, yeah, that's kind of where all of this was born from. I think it was kind of the desire to help people. And, um, definitely the, the whole pastoral thing, um, helped. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious too, with businesses that are coaching businesses, which is what you work with, you know, a lot of people in my life want to become coaches when they meet me, they start to talk to me. Yeah. I start to tell them the space I'm in, you know, I work with people who are often, um, they're not, some are struggling with addiction, but they're looking mm. to manage it while they manage right. big, big businesses and they manage families. And, and I also work with uh, people who are uh, also not struggling with addiction, but they're, right. they, they want to work with someone who has that background, who's, who's become a coach and written a book like myself. Mm. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm kind of curious to the people that have these big hearts and they just want to mm-hmm. help and, and they have a hard time asking for money because they're like, oh, I would do this for free. Yeah. You know, what advice would you have for people in the space that I'm in um, who want to, who really do deserve, in my mm. opinion, to make money, but they yeah. they just are not willing to, to 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 ask for the sale, put themselves out there, market the market themselves. Mm-hmm. What, what would you say to those people? Yeah, so I kind of start from uh, ten thousand feet above type of view, and I start by asking the questions. Well, 
at the end of the day, if you just want to coach people and never ask for money, start a charity, work for a nonprofit. There, there are options for you to coach without having to ever ask for money or work for someone else. There's legitimately options. And I do truly believe that there is a big group of people in the entrepreneurial space who aren't made to be entrepreneurs. And I know that might sound a little bit harsh, but the truth is, I think that is the case. So that's the first thing I'll say is like, would you rather go work for someone else, work for someone else's practice, have a charity, work for a nonprofit, whatever it is that does this work, and you don't have to learn how to market and sell yourself? There is a legitimate option and route that you can take to go down that path. We live in a world where there are certain rules in place. One of the rules is, is if you're in business for yourself, you need to make a profit to survive in this world. That's 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 the case. That's just frankly where, where we're at. That's the rules that we have set up in place in society, um, especially obviously in, in America. And so a big thing is when I'm having this conversation with people is asking them, do you really wanna be an entrepreneur or do you wanna work for someone else? Some people actually just go and work for someone else. And I'm glad I was able to help them understand maybe that's a better solution for them. Now, if you do want to be an entrepreneur and you do want to run a business and you do still want to make money, but you're scared to ask for money, then we need to come down to a bit of a mindset talk in some ways, but also just a logical talk. Like a lot of people will say, you have to learn to charge your worth. And I actually very much disagree with that. I find a lot of people are told to like, well, you're worth it. You should charge for it. I don't like to ever attach self-worth to money. It's probably one of the slipperiest slopes in the world because the truth is if you get a lot of clients, you have this high self-worth. If you get no clients, you have zero self-worth. And so it's a bad slope to be on. And so I like to go more so from a logical standpoint. I like to go from a, how many people would you like to work with? What type of income would allow you to live the life that would be comfortable and stress-free for you? What type of income would allow you to continue this work, maybe even save for your future, maybe even save for retirement, maybe even save for if you have kids or whatever it is you want to do? Let's think about that aspect of it. Because at the end of the day, if you're not thinking about those tactical and logical reasons for why you should be asking for money, it's hard to ask for money. And a lot of people have other jobs as they're building their coaching business. So they're like, oh, that's kind of like my, this is my side hustle. I don't need to be making money. And I just, I like to ask people, if you have this vision, what are you willing to do to make it happen? And you're going to have to find a way to market and sell yourself. And the truth is people out there that are willing to pay money every single day. There's people who, I always say, people love to buy stuff. They don't like to be sold stuff. They like to buy stuff. Yeah. So learn how to be a heart-centered entrepreneur. Do I call it heart-centered sales and do it in a way that people don't feel like you're being sold to. I will say one more thing here. A lot of people are scared to sell hard and promote hard because they have had a bad past experience. Now, if we would always avoid things because we've had bad past experiences, we'd miss out on a lot of life. Growing up, I was scared of dogs. If I would have taken that past experience and put it for the rest of my life, I wouldn't have the dogs that I have right now. And I love dogs now. So we have to realize just because we had a bad past experience doesn't mean that if we do marketing and sales, that we have to do it in a bad way. There's a better way to do it as well. And so it's coming down to, are you open that there's a better way? Are you willing to see that this is needed to actually like the rules of business needed to survive? And are you willing to get to a place where this is your full-time income and you actually rely on it and your family relies on it? So those are a couple of pieces I work through. You can tell I'm definitely more on the rational side versus the mindset side, because I find the mindset side is a little bit inflated as far as when people talk about money. Yeah. And I think I saw a video of yours and you know, there's even books written about this. One of my favorite books, like people buy you, right? So people buy you, they buy who you are. Mm -hmm. They're not just buying what you're selling, right? So so someone might choose your product over someone else's yeah. because they're buying you. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it is the quality of the content, but a lot of times it's like, who is this person, right? Can I yeah. trust this person? Can exactly. you speak to that a little bit more about? For sure. Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah, people buy both from feelings and from logic. Usually it's based off of emotions, but it has this logical backing. So, and this is something I share with a lot of the clients I work with is that, what usually is going to set you apart is who you are and your story and how you relate to a certain audience on social media. 
you relate better than a lot of your competitors because of who you are to your ideal clients. And so you need to basically, I always tell people, you need to embody who you are and the story and the transformation you've been on. And you need to put that out there to attract similar types of people. Once you're able to do that, your competition becomes a lot smaller. There might be some co competitors still, but you're, you're standing out a lot better in the space because your ideal clients are relating to you more. That's one of the biggest steps. When people want to like know, like, and trust you before they buy from you, they want to have some points of relatability or things that they can understand or they can be like, oh, we're similar in some ways. Because if you don't relate to someone, even if they have the results that you want, but you don't relate at all, your brain automatically goes to this place of like, yeah, they have the results, but they're nothing like me. And so I don't know if I could get the results like they got the results because I'm very different from them, right? So if I feel different to someone, if I feel like I am just a different person, I just have different values, I'm just not at all like them, I don't automatically think I can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, the opposite is if I feel like I'm very similar, right? If I find someone who's like, wow, they've like basically done exactly what I want to do. They're very similar. They have very similar values, a very similar backstory, and they've done it, then I can do it as well. And so that's how you stand out is you become a lot of people I see online, social media, Instagram, they're flexing and trying to show how they're like better than most people. It's doing the opposite of what they want. You need to show how you're quite like most people. That will help you with your business. That will help you be a much more human to human connection online and allow you to get more clients. So instead of being like, a lot of people create what they call authority content, being like, I'm the authority. I need to be like impressive and all these different things. Rather create content that connects with most of your ideal clients, most of your following, because that will automatically in their brain, they're going to start to think they're like me and they did it. They could probably teach me how to do it as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that's exactly how I've even survived the last many years is because mm. people have come into my life through my recovery background and from, right. from whatever, from, from 12 steps, from outside of 12 steps, from trainings I've been to that I've paid to attend people meet me and then they go, Oh my God, this guy can do it. I definitely can do it. And I think that that's really inspiring for people to, to know you and get to mm -hmm. get to know you better. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that I struggled with is how do I consistently put content out that's speaking to my audience and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I become tied up in that. Cause I'm like, well, am I speaking to someone with addiction that has a lot uh, of success as entrepreneur? Am I speaking to someone who right. has already healed addiction? So I get tied up in my own stories of how I want yeah. to market. So how would you For help sure. someone? How would you help someone like me who's stuck in that? Those are great questions. I come across these every single week. And at the end of the day, you have a couple different choices here and they're not right or wrong but they might help you understand what, how to make things simpler versus more complex. A lot of people I work with, they're so used to marketing and messaging to the type of ideal client who needs convincing to work with them. And at the end of the day, there is basically you have ideal clients right now in every stage of the journey that you've been on. You have ideal clients who are one step behind you two steps behind you, three steps, four steps, five steps, six steps, whatever it is. So you have an opportunity to create content, messaging, copy, marketing, advertisement to any single one of those people along the different steps. Now, the further away you go from yourself where you currently are, the more convincing you're going to have to do to help that person become a client. And this is, I see it all the time. For instance, if you're working with someone in recovery, like let's say one of my friends, Jacob, I know we connected about him. He works with a lot of people who are, yeah, getting over substance abuse and different things like that. Now, he used to market to the people who are in the depths of despair. And they were so, number one, hard to work with. A lot of them needed convincing to work with. And a lot of them wouldn't even finish the programs. They had different things they had to go through. So we started to message and market to the people who already had decided that they were going to quit, that they were going to go into recovery. They already had done a couple months and they'd been working on different things. We decided to start to market to those people. And number one, we got better clients. We had people that were more committed 
who went through the programs, who got better results. And so a big thing you're going to want to look at is who do I really want to work with and who does not need convincing? And the beautiful thing is you have, you don't have to use your entire story to market. This is where a lot of people get it wrong. They're like, well, I have to market with my story. So I have to talk about like from when I was young to where I am now. No, you don't have to. I, I don't necessarily do that. In my marketing, I mainly talk about specific parts of my story that will attract the type of client I want to work with who is at the right stage in their business. Mm. For me, like I work with online coaches, if I would try to convince people to become online coaches and then build their business, that would take a lot of work. A lot of them are maybe they're going to be convinced and then unconvinced. Rather, I want to work with people who are already convinced. They have years under their belt. They've put money towards it. They want this in the long term. They have a big vision. So I grab my parts of my story that connect with those people and I utilize that. And so those are a couple of things that I think through as far as I think of my story, how it connects to my audience, who do I want to work with? And again, the farther you have to go back, the more convincing you have to do, usually the more complex the business becomes. Once you become a little bit closer to you as far as maybe they're only two to three steps behind you and they don't have to be as convinced as much because they're already on the journey. That's usually where I find a lot of my clients find the sweet spot in their ideal client avatar and in their messaging and in their marketing. So if there's someone listening right now that's looking to just like get started, they're like, I don't know yeah. what to do. I yeah. just want to, I have a big heart. I know I've coached some people. I've helped them to gain some results. Where would you have them start if they were going to just like get started? Would it be like yeah. a Instagram reels or would it be a blog or what would it be like Great 2024? Question. I'm really interested. 2024. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of interesting shifts in the marketplace right now. I mean, literally the last three months, a lot of the clients I'm working with, even clients who are doing 20, 30, $40,000 a month, we've radically shifted strategies. So I think if someone's starting brand new, um, I would first make sure that they'd be okay with creating video content. Cause I do think video content right now is at a really good place in a lot of ways. Um, I would more than likely get them started either on a Facebook or an Instagram. Um, those seem to still be the dominant platforms that most successful coaches are on. Now, I do have some clients on TikTok, YouTube, or even LinkedIn doing $40,000 a month. So I'm not saying that those aren't good options. Um, but I'm saying most people start and find success on Facebook or Instagram. Now, the way that I think about it when I think about simplifying things is I think about basically you want to be doing three different things every single day. And so I call it DMO, a daily method of operation. When you're just starting, you need to focus on three different numbers. All you need to think about is, can I get new ideal clients to my audience today? So new leads coming in. Can I nurture the audience that I already have today? And can I sell to the leads that are already nurtured? That's all I have to think about every single day. Now, as far as the mechanics go, there is a multitude of ways to grow an audience, Facebook, Instagram, right? So yes, Reels is a great one. And posting Reels right now, I mean, I actually, I have a bit of a side hustle Instagram account. It's my life in the mountains here. Started it two years ago, just for fun. It's grown by 20,000 people the last couple of months here. Mm. And from Reels, yes, so Reels are, are doing very well. But at the end of the day, I have some clients who don't grow their audiences at all through Reels. They use other methods and they're still very successful. So that's why I always come down to the, the key is audience growth, audience nurture, audience conversion. That's the non-negotiable. The mechanics of how that happens is negotiable. There is flexibility there. And so in simple terms, yes, content is still always going to be important, but it doesn't necessarily, if, if you like will never do video content, if you're just like, I can't do video content, have like hope that there's ways to grow a business without doing that. Um, Cause some of my clients right now, they don't create video content ever and they're still doing great 10, 20 K months. Um, but I wanted to really bring it back to what actually matters. Cause a lot of people want to talk about the, the, the hack or the strategy that's working right now on social media. That's fun. That's okay. But always coming back down to those three things. If you end your business day and you ask yourself those three questions, if did my audience grow, did it nurture my audience? Did I convert people who were nurtured? If your answer can be yes to those three, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter the mechanics. Again, so many business coaches in my space will preach 
one way or like it's not going to work for you, right? This is the only way. I like to come in with a different approach. No, the one way is you you need new leads that are going to buy in a profitable way that you can deliver, that you can resign, that you can get referrals from. That's the non-negotiable. That's the one way. That's literally how every single business in the entire world works. As far as mechanics go, that's where we have a world of creativity. That's where we have a world of multiple options where I love to come in and obviously help my clients decide which options. But again, I like to, I like to separate those two because people get so entrenched in, okay, I have to do the strategy. And if it doesn't work, nothing else will work for me. Mm -hmm. It's not the case. There's a lot of great options out there. Yeah. And you can just kind of see if you look into Instagram specifically, like there's people who have really good uh, and big pages with just text. They just have text. They just have quotes. Yes. And, you know, um, a guy I just recently actually spoke to, a uh, holistic therapist, all he really does is just post <laughs> these really good looking quotables that he mm. comes up with about therapy and holistic health. And yeah, it's amazing content and he has a good following doing it. So it shows you mm -hmm. like, it's not about the reels, you know, for him, it's, it's about mm -hmm. this, this content consistently coming out. That's really interesting, engaging. It comes out more than once a day. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's a really, and then you have people who have memes that have huge followings with memes yeah. and, um, yeah. So I think it, it, it's gotta be true for you. You know, what's, what's true for you, what's going to work for the audience that you're, mm -hmm. you're speaking to that, exactly. that makes a lot of sense. Exactly. And that's where, like, at the end of the day, like I said, it doesn't like content content's kind of a non-negotiable in a lot of ways but it doesn't matter because even though instagram right now reels are the main way to grow an audience because they have the reach to get onto explore pages and stuff like that something like memes or quotes they still can grow your audience if they're good enough that people share them with other people right or even share them to their own stories i think the the stats are right now like if the average per time you get like someone to share your post to their stories you're getting like an extra 300 views yeah. per 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 time it happens right and so that's where people can still be growing audiences with these other types of content. Your content just needs to be good and not necessarily good as far as production level that can help, but just good as far as like, it's solid, it's valuable people like actually like, again, it's relevant for them. It's applicable for them, et cetera. And so everyone, not everyone, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that good content has to be a certain way. It's really like, what's actually going to just like, really hit home with people and what are they going to be like oh this is so good i need to share this with people or this is so good i'm gonna put on my stories or i'm gonna save this for later um if your content does that it's going to grow your audience whether it's a static post or a video so one of the things i know a lot of people struggle with including myself is is adhd you know mm, yes so so a lot of people go to get they they, they want to get started they want to do it and then the adhd kicks in and they're like <laughs> okay I, yeah. I, I can't do this. So what do you do for that? Like, I know you talked about nature yeah. healing and, and some of the things I've seen you share, but what, what do you think is going to help someone who's really ready to go, but they, there's ADHD? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I actually only learned that I have ADHD. Uh, this is about nine months ago. So I had built these businesses. We, we had done great, uh, multiple seven figures. And then all of a sudden, one of my friends here was like, you have ADHD, right? And I was like, I don't think so. And they're like, no, I'm like you definitely do. So I took one of those tests. I was like, yeah, you have it. And I was like, oh, okay, let's see. So I went to like a psychologist and then officially got diagnosed with it and got diagnosed. There's, there's a couple different ways you can get diagnosed with it. Uh, but I got kind of diagnosed with both ends of the spectrum. So both on the um, hyperactive and then also on the other end of the spectrum of inattentive um, and distracted. And so now the nice thing is for myself, my lifestyle kind of curbs the hyperactive. I, I like, I'm a big mountain lover. I love to get out into nature. I love to like exercise out there, climb the mountains, trail run, all that kind of fun stuff. And that really helps me with the hyperactive element. That really helps kind of like calm me down, allows me to be more present. Now the inattentive side has been the side that I've had to work on more so. And that's where for me, 
um, to be completely honest, like my phone, because I work on it all the time, is actually something that I need to be very careful about outside of my work time. Because I can very easily just be like multitasking, not working, and just on my phone doing different things and not being present, being very inattentive to the relationships in my personal life. So me needing to have better boundaries for when I don't have my phone on with me is very important and has been helpful to me. Um, now, to be completely frank, I know some people are pro-medication, some people are against medication. I do some days of the week take medication for my ADHD. The reason being is because I notice a substantial difference on the days when I need to use what they call executive function, when I need to have this like very admin kind of like working through this kind of executive functioning work when I do need some help from medication. So the nice thing with the medication I'm on, I take it a couple times a week. Um, it's out of my system by the next day and I can kind of choose which days I want to take it and which days I don't need to take it. And so I do utilize it. Some people might be against that. That's totally fair. You can have your own opinion. For me, I can tell a big difference. So I don't take it on the weekends. And I'll usually take it maybe three or four days during the week, yeah. depending on what my work schedule looks like. Sure. And so that's been a big piece for me. So I kind of, I like the blend of like using nature, trying to really understand how I'm utilizing my phone. And also as an entrepreneur, understanding which tasks I'm inherently weak at right. and outsourcing those as soon as I have the financial means to do it. For instance, you have a bookkeeper, I have an executive assistant, I have uh, an accountant, I have these different pieces in my life that allow me to hand stuff off. So I've also built like my business systems around actually like my, my weaknesses being outsourced as quickly as possible. You can't outsource everything in life. Well, maybe if you're a billionaire, but mo there's still some things that you're gonna have to do yourself. And that's where for me, the medication and, and the different tools have been helpful for me. Um, in just learning more about how my mind functions and how I can help with it. So, yeah, thanks for being honest. I mean, I think this show is really about honesty and about people's journeys of recovery, even ADHD mm -hmm. recovery. So I think that, yeah, you know, the, the transparency that you shared is really helpful because some people do benefit from medication. Some people mm -hmm. benefit from psychedelics. Some people benefit from religion. Some people benefit right. from breath work. Some people benefit yeah. from all of them together. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really what I'd like to bring guests on to knit to learn is like, hey, what works for you? Because we're, sure. we're all we're all different and we have similarities, but we have differences. And I think our journey to wellness is, it can be really different, you know, because you're up in the Rockies exactly. in Canada, you know, you got the yeah. mountains right there where if I live in New York city, um, you know, I'm going to have to find another way to find nature. And exactly. So I really appreciate you, you sharing that. And yeah. So when you think about, so that's really helpful in this. And there's obviously if people would go back to some of the other resources I've shared on the show or some of the other mm -hmm. guests, they can learn other ways to, to manage ADHD. And um, sure. so I really appreciate your journey. So I know that you also have had um, a run in with uh, your wife having cancer and, and that journey. Yeah. And what was that like during that time? Because I'm yeah. curious, I didn't, I didn't know you when that happened. So what, how did you kind For of sure. work through that? Yeah, it's, um, it definitely, I mean, yeah. So my wife got diagnosed, um, about two and a half years ago and she fought it. She's in remission now. It's been about a year and three or four months in remission, mm. um, something like that. And so, I mean, definitely a very hard season, definitely not something I would want anyone else to go through. Um, I think, I think, I think a couple pieces that I could speak on here, cause obviously I'm not the one that went through it. Uh, but a couple of the pieces that I can speak on is number one is that hard times make you strong in a lot of ways. And I think the, that my wife and I had gone through a lot of hard times financially, different relationships, different whatever it was, had in some ways prepared us to like go through hard seasons again. And hard seasons are fun to go through. We don't want to go through them, but they do also prepare us for the ups and downs of life. And so that's kind of some of the, some of the views that we've taken with us. The, the second thing I will say is um, as an entrepreneur, um, it was a massive blessing that we had the business that we had um, because frankly, if I would have been working a different job, 
um, we might have gone under financially or I wouldn't have had the time to spend with my wife. I, I think I only missed one appointment the whole um, eight months that she was in it. Mm-hmm. And um, that was just such a big blessing for me is that um, entrepreneurship gave me the ability to be there for the people that I cared about. And so, um, yeah, and obviously not every business would give you that freedom, um, but the, how the business had been set up, how my team had been operating and all that kind of all the systems I had put in place allowed for that. And so it's even something thinking for the future, not that I plan for bad things to happen. I, I try to, I'm trying to more even so set myself up to be like, hey, if I am needed on a personal note or a personal level moving forward in any way, I want the business to be set up in a correct way. I want to have the financial freedom to do so. I want to have the team to allow me to do so, the systems. Um, because, yeah, no one really plans for the for the hard times. But now, like, going through a couple of them, it's like I can actually plan ahead. And so, um, anyways, entrepreneurship was a big blessing in that season for sure. Um, yeah, I went to every chemo appointment. I was, I was there. I was even, yeah. I, I worked a lot less during that season for sure. And um, obviously the business took a little bit of a hit because of that. Um, but um, it was well worth it. Very well worth it. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you sound like an amazing guy, uh, Ruben. <laughs> and I also- We try. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate you sharing that story because I'm sure that that is something that you have to prepare for, even though it's, it's kind mm-hmm. of in remission, but to know, like to set yourself up that yeah. these things are going to happen. It happened to the best of us. Right. And, mm-hmm. and to have a plan and, and having the freedom of on, being an entrepreneur can be really helpful in that season of life. So yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that. So when I, mm-hmm. when I hear about, um, what you're, what you're up to, what is your vision or highest intentions that you're bringing to reality mm-hmm. right now? Oh, that's a great question. Wow. I mean, on the business side of things, uh, we're definitely going through a bit of a, a growth curve right now where uh, we're definitely starting to notice a lot more people are really getting behind the whole heart centered and business savvy, wanting to create that for themselves. And so we're going through a bit of a growth curve and I'm, I'm excited for where it's taking us. Um, there's definitely some goals as far as building out our business and our team and the vision and even even doing retreats up here in the Canadian Rockies with more people. There's there's a lot of stuff that I'm really excited about that we're building out right now. Um, and even on the personal side, I mean, I'm quite excited for um, a lot of the stuff that my wife, Terry, and I got planned. Um, I'm, I'm kind of diving more into the athletic side as well. I'm, I'm getting into different um, or trail races and mountain kind of sports and stuff like that. Um, getting coached in there. I got two coaches. I walk the walk. I get my own coaches. And so, no, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up that, um, yeah, I can't wait to see where it goes. I feel I feel like there's this big movement of people who, again, like I said, really care about the work they do, want to have great sustainable businesses, but also want to have this work-life balance and be able to like really connect and disconnect at the same time. I'm seeing a lot of these people wanting to get into nature more, but all, like a lot of my clients, it's, it's really funny. Um, the, I'll jump on a Zoom call with them and three of them last week were sitting outside in nature and wanting to take their calls outside. And I just thought that was such a good example of like, hey, these are obviously the people I attract because obviously I share my parts of my story, so I'm attracting them. But I really, really like where the world is going in that way in a lot of ways. And so I am excited to keep pushing that envelope and serving more people in those respects. I think yeah. it's so it's so important, you know, because being an entrepreneur or not being an entrepreneur, health is wealth. And so if you don't have your health, I don't care how good things are, you know, mm-hmm. things are going to be difficult. And I think that, you know, taking that time to get outside and, you know, sign up for races or doing things that, you know, put yeah. this thing in the future that you have to commit to now is really helpful, yeah. especially with exercise. So I think that's, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Definitely an important part of, uh, wholeness, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, uh, it's good to have those objectives and those goals and those, the vision for it. Cause I mean, without vision, a lot of us are kind of lost on what direction we should go to. Right. So, um, everyone needs to have some sort of vision, even if it's only vision for the next six months or the next year, I feel like that in and of itself is fine. Sometimes we can't see the 10 year plan until we get to a year from now. And so it's totally fine to, to have a shorter term vision, but something you're working towards it, it holds you 
uh, kind of committed, account uh, accountable to it. Um, and it also gets you excited for stuff because you, you have something that you want to achieve. And um, yeah, we're supposed to love the journey, but achieving stuff is fun as well. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. The vision is huge. And I really like how you said that. So many people talk about their five year vision or their 10 year vision. And I'm mm -hmm. like, man, I've been, I am so not for that right now. I am for like what's happening a year from now, what's happening mm -hmm. six months from now, because so much yeah. is changing here in the United States. The economy is changing. Totally. There's so much shift, shifts, so many shifts happening right now. I've never seen so many people struggling financially as I do now that are business mm -hmm. owners. And I'm and it, you know, it's not every segment of every industry, but, but many of the people I know are, are, it's slow. Business is slow. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's just an interesting time. So for me, I'm all about mm -hmm. like, Hmm, breathwork certification. What else do <laughs> I want to do? You know, I'm kind of like looking at what is my next six months to a year look like? Where, where in For the sure. past I did do the five year vision, I did have the mm -hmm. five year, but so much changes yeah. in a year, you know? Oh, so much. It's, yeah. And again, you can have them, but I just find that every single 12 months that goes by, things are different in your situation and in the environment that you're surrounded by. And so it's, uh, it's totally fine to have the five year plan um, or the big, big vision. But I'm always like, I like to break it down into smaller pieces. Um, cause once you achieve the smaller pieces, then you have better understanding, better feedback, better, even knowledge of how you feel with that new achievement and the direction you're going and you make adjustments along the way and nothing wrong with adjustments. That's uh, I think that's part of being human. Well, Ruben, man, it's been a, a really amazing couple of weeks getting to know you. And we, we've had a couple of conversations outside of this and I love the work that you're doing. Um, it's actually work that I'm considering maybe even hiring you for, uh, as I get clear on my one year, six months vision, yeah, for sure. what I want to scale. And my coaching has always been something that I've wanted to scale, but I get sidetracked with some other work. Like I do trainings mm -hmm. and facilitation professionally. So, right. but I, but I really am interested in what would it like to scale my coaching business just for even yeah. for like a year, you know, and maybe for, for sure. three years. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. You're definitely a heart-centered entrepreneur, without a doubt. And um, is there anything that you'd like to share with our audience as we come to a close here? Any, any message for them? Anything that you feel like you want to share? Yeah, I think, I think the main message is that sometimes it can feel like, as a heart-centered entrepreneur, that things are moving slow or like you should be further ahead than you are right now. And um, sure, are there ways to speed things up? Yes, there are. But I just, I want a lot of people to know that it's not necessarily that you're behind. It's just that there's a lot of lessons to learn along the way. For myself, again, like I said at the beginning, the only reason, the only way I ever got good at stuff and became successful in any means at anything was through sticking with it and taking the next step. So that's important because if you just stick with it, but you never do new things or try new things or become uncomfortable, it won't move. So you need to be resilient and also open to trying new things, trying harder things, becoming uncomfortable. And so um, if you're feeling like you're behind, I mean, you can work through that feeling. Rather, I would say is feel like you're on the path and there's a lot of lessons to learn and that it's okay if it takes some time. If the destination is worth taking time, go on the journey. I love that. Yes. Amen. To, amen to that. I really appreciate it, Ruben. Uh, tell people how, tell us, tell people how they can find you. Where's the best place to, to find yeah, you? There's a lot of, yeah. That Facebook group's called Coaches Creating Impact. Um, and uh, it's a great spot for people to yeah join and uh, check out the community. Well, I appreciate your time today. I definitely would love to bring you back on. And especially if uh, I hire you in the next few months here, bring you on and um, bring you into my world and we try to scale this coaching business would definitely want to bring you back and share that journey as well. Yeah, that'd be very fun. Yeah, definitely looking forward to uh, more conversations. All right, my friend. Well, thanks so much, Ruben. Really appreciate you having, having you on the show today. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening and bye for now. Thanks for watching today's episode. Your support means the world to me. So thank you for liking and subscribing to the YouTube channel and to this podcast. We've got amazing content and amazing interviews coming out soon. So thanks again. Enjoy your day. Sending loving blessings to you all.